Good morning and welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living Midtown. We're here to remind you that such is the nature of life that all it asks and all it wants is the opportunity to appear. You are that opportunity and so am I and so it is. We welcome you because we are a center that honors and respects all people. We recognize you for who you are, an expression of that divine life showing up as your individual self. We know that you're someone who brings goodness and life into the world in the best possible ways. And we're here to support you in that through spiritual practices, through learning principles, and through inspiration and other forms of education. So I'm really grateful you're with us. We have a wonderful speaker, Reverend Cynthia Paulson, who's going to speak to us on forgiveness and the power and purpose and benefit, great benefit of forgiveness. So stay tuned. We'll, you'll hear from her a little later. However, first our practitioners are going to share with you something of what we believe. Listen up as you hear the Declaration of Principle. I believe. I believe. I believe in one God. One absolute power and first cause to all things. I believe that this power is perfect love. And create out of a desire to express love. I believe all thought is creative and how I choose to think creates my personal experience. I believe in the unity of all life. And the immortality of the individual soul. Forever unfolding. I believe. I believe. I believe in the eternal goodness. The eternal goodness of God. The eternal loving kindness and the eternal givingness of God to all. And so it is. And so it is. And so it is. Thank you, that was wonderful. A practitioner is someone who is well trained in this teaching, who has learned to use it for themselves and make it available to other people. They do individual work for others in prayer, in affirmative prayer, and in some forms of spiritual coaching. So if you have an area of your life that you feel not quite right or stuck in, it would be wonderful to contact a practitioner. You can get, gather one through our website, reach out to them, and they'll get back in touch with you and work with you in whatever area of your life you feel the need, whether that is the area of health, your wealth, your love life or your prosperity. We're here for you. Today we're going to hear from one of our practitioners, Maya Fuller, as she shares some good ideas and as she brings to you some guided, led affirmative prayer. Thank you, Maya. Greetings, CSL Midtown. Happy morning to you. Today's topic is forgiveness. And I have recently experienced some um, um, experiences of forgiveness in my life. And I wanted to share the story with you. As practitioners, you know that what we do uh, is we take these principles and we use them in our lives. And not only licensed practitioners, this is all of us, right? We are practitioners of the science of mind. And as I have experienced this story of moving from upset to uh, seeing some signs of forgiveness, I have been very well aware of how these spiritual principles have been um, operating. So I just wanted to share that story with you before I go into a spiritual mind treatment for forgiveness. So. Um, in my family, my uh, dad's side of the family, there has been over the years lots of kind of like contention between, um, goodness gracious, my uh, my father and his his children. Uh, he has um, children from 
different marriages, different relationships that he's been in. So there are four of us and uh, we all have three different mothers. So that means we're all raised in three different um, ways, right? By three different uh, mothers. And so raised in three different ways, we have three different family backgrounds in terms of, you know, us being connected with our, our mother's family. And we've, each of us had um, relatively little um, real life living, growing up interaction with my, with our father. None of us were raised with him. And, um, and, um, just there's been, mis been misunderstandings with, um, him, his mom, my, my father, um, my father's mother, my father's aunt among, I mean, my father's sister among all of us. So um, just lots of rumblings throughout the years. Um, really, uh, maybe my some of my, my me and some of my siblings aren't really jiving too jiving too well with my aunt. And then uh, apparently there are stories been told by the aunt or the this one or that one to the siblings that have caused some sibling inter you know interruptions between us or or misunderstandings happen between the siblings, just a lot of just rumblings. And throughout it all, my father's like, you know, saying he's, you know, feeling so guilty or expressing his guilt for not having, you know, uh, been the, the best father. And so lots of kind of pain and stuff like that. Along with that, uh, a pain that, or dis, these discomforts that have been, uh, ex we've been experiencing throughout the years, my uh, father got married about, I don't know, a little bit over 10 years ago. And um, it's so interesting how it's like love is a great unifier, but sometimes um, the appearance of the opposite of love can be a great unifier. So many of the characters in the story, including my father, have had major issues with the, the stepmother. And the stepmother is like all of our kind of issues that we've had have been like quietly kept, like kind of underground. Um, like we might express it to the, um, you know, like some upset we have with the aunt. We might express it to the sibling or, or some upset we have with the father. We might express to the sibling or or something like that. Or some some upset um, some of us might have with the siblings might be expressed to the father, but just gently, you see what I'm saying? Not with this, you know, big energy. It's just been like rumbling underneath of of, of our lives. <clears throat> but this stepmother, she's like in your face, and she's like very basically. I would say metaphysically, this idea that as within, so without. She really is like really. <laughs> um, um, the projection really of all of this, this kind of upset. And, um, one thing that we tend to agree upon is that, Ooh, she's a tough one. She's a really tough one. Um, and, uh, but in order to, she's a, and she's a member of our family. And in order for me to, to, um, converse with my father or visit him or these things like that, then I come into contact with the, um, his wife. And I call her a wife and not stepmother because, like I said, they've only been married about 10 years and she's not really old enough to be my mother. <laughs> so um, not meaning disrespect there. But um, in this in your face kind of relationship that whenever uh, it's almost almost like whenever um, I speak to her or she speaks to one of us, there is, tends to be like this big like explosions. And, um, so we were just talking about something that for, uh, for me, these things are for general public, these things can, uh, end up being benign, but she's very sensitive. And if you don't agree with her, uh, then she really can like really blow up, blow up at you. And, um, I know this is just my perception of the things. I know that metaphysically there's so much more, um, involved, but I'm just sharing the story with you. So uh, we had um, a lovely conversation, but then she started where we're just talking about scheduling meeting each other. And then she started kind of telling me an upsetting story that she had, like an argument or a fight or something like, you know, argument that she was having with my dad or something like that. And um, I said something to her in it, you know, of course, being compassionate, saying to her, you know, I understand I would be upset too. But I said something to her within that, that, you know, she, that I didn't, that was not in agreement with what she said. And she's like, 
blew up. She blew up and she's trying, she's starting to attack me and all these things. And I have, I have operated with these people by staying away from them, um, by just staying away from them. But you know what? I am just tired of the fight. I'm tired of the fight. And what I decided to do this time is to say to her, we have to stop this. <laughs> let's please let's stop this. Please let's just um, operate in love. Let us just be loving. And I just, for some reason, something came over me and I just kept saying, you know, we can love each other. We can we can forgive each other. We can understand that sometimes we, the, each one of us will say things that we're mis either we misunderstand or we don't agree with, but we can still forgive each other for that. Let us establish a new relationship within ourselves. Let us decide, you and I, that we come together. We come together as a sisterhood. When we see each other, we are like best friends. We're friends. We're friendly with each other. We love each other. We like each other. And she was like, ah. And I just kept saying that, you know, just love, just love, just love, 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 forgiveness, kindness, forgiveness, love, love, love. And by the end of the, com you know, I felt, I felt myself being disarmed by just really abiding in the consciousness of love. And instead of being upset with her and holding something against her and like saying, you know, you're attacking me for this, instead of um, having to create situations that I had to forgive or love automatically uh, allowed forgiveness to come. So in that, just at the end, all she said was okay. And in that, I ended up getting a phone call from her daughter because there has been issues with her daughter and all of our siblings. I got a phone call from her daughter inviting me to her party. And at first, you know, it was a couple of days later. So at first I was like in my old mindset, right? But then I remembered, okay, we're doing, you know, I'm, we're doing love and this lady's reaching out to me, sending an olive branch, um, uh, you know, extending an olive branch. Let me, and I had intended to cover the situation with love you know, a couple of days ago, like if the daughter contacts me or whenever I see the daughter to cover the situation with love, but I hadn't really, um, didn't know how I was going to get there. I had the willingness, but I didn't know how to actually feel that way, how to really go get to the space of forgiveness the way I had with um, her mom by just having this love, love, love. Um, so I remembered, I remembered love. I remembered how good it felt for me to just, you know, transcend the upset and transcend the situation. And so when she invited me, I ended up going to her party and we ended up having, um, a, a lovely time. I saw the, my step, I saw the, my stepmother, my father's wife, I saw the stepsister and, um, it was just, I, you know, gave her flowers and, you know, brought gifts for the event that she was doing. And, um, extended my olive branch as well. We're talking about forgiveness that was really inspired by the concept of love. We know that love is the great unifier. Uh, Ernest Holmes says, love is free of con condona condona condemnation. And I would say that something that, um, that came out of that is in expressing the situation to my brother and to my father, and of course, to my father's wife, the, the concept of just love and forgiveness, uh, we ended up having a little um, f a family Zoom meeting, one of our first family Zoom meetings that includes my father and my aunt and uh, the siblings and our offspring, where we, uh, um, the, the, children, the siblings and offspring, are learning about our family history. And in that conversation, at the end of that conversation, my brother really spoke up and said that we have to just experience forgiveness and love among one another. Let us experience love and forgiveness among one another. Put down our petty gripes. Um, allow love to be the great unifier. And um, it was beautiful. In the end, everyone was just saying, I love you. We all agree to just let these things go. And I do believe I can, the same way I felt the love overcome uh this the situation when I was on the phone with my stepmother um, I felt that this was a real sincere loving forgiveness um, time for us so my message basically is that one of the ways that we can experience forgiveness is through love and I'm so grateful and thankful for these teachings that have allowed me to um, 
to really deep dive into love and forgiveness. So let me just do a quick spiritual mind treatment about love and forgiveness. We know that there's one presence, one power in the universe, and that presence and power is God. We know God as infinite intelligent life, infinite intelligent love. There's only one, and that one is love. Any ideas of separation, any ideas of anything other than love are just false beliefs. So we take this time right now to align ourselves with love, knowing that love knows no condemnation. Knowing that if we stand, find ourselves steeped and standing in love, there is nothing to forgive. There's nothing to forgive. There's only been love. Anything that we've had, any experiences that we've had in life that look opposite from it, we know that the reality behind them is love, whether we can see it or not. And we just give thanks right now that any ideas that have shown up in our lives that seem opposite of love are leading us to love, are leading us to forgiveness, are leading us to our true nature, which is oneness with, one, which is oneness with God, oneness with good. So I allow that to be the truth for myself today, and I invite everyone to allow this to be the truth for themselves today, that we steep ourselves in love, and through love comes natural forgiveness. I give thanks that this is so, and I allow it to be, and so it is. Amen. Thanks so much for watching. And here's our, our music for the day.
Good morning. I want to thank Maya for that beautiful family story. That was um, probably a hard thing to share, and I just want to thank her for that. That was wonderful to hear. So this whole month, we have been practicing what we teach, exploring different spiritual practices that help us live our best lives. Today, as you know, I get to talk about forgiveness, which I think we all know can be complicated and challenging. It's really just a principle to put into practice in our lives. It's biblical, which I'll talk more about in a moment. But in preparing for this talk, I kept asking myself, why is forgiveness so complicated? And one thing that kept occurring to me is the people and things and situations that need forgiving happen on a very wide spectrum. There are things that cause us minimal pain and inconvenience, and they might be easy to forgive. And then there are things that cause us such deep pain and sometimes can cause lifelong suffering, so much that they may seem impossible to forgive. So for instance, just to throw out a couple of examples, let's say you have a lunch date planned with your best friend, and she forgets about it, and she doesn't show up. And you're sitting in the restaurant waiting, and you have to text her and remind her, and you both laugh about it, and she rushes to come meet you. Probably not that big of a deal to forgive your best friend, right? There's a big difference between forgiving something like that and forgiving a stranger who has murdered your child. That got dark real quickly. I can't even fathom that kind of pain and having to do the spiritual work to forgive something like that. Yet it's the same principle to apply to these hurts, whether they are small and inconsequential or enormous and life-altering. There is simplicity to the spiritual principle of forgiveness, but that doesn't make it simple or easy to do. The simplicity is the belief that we are all good and we are all one, one with each other, one with God, the good. When I think of some of the big, horrible, tragic things that people have had to forgive, like mass shootings, physical and mental abuse, things like the Holocaust, where do you even begin? Anne Frank wrote in her diary, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. I think she was 13 when she wrote that, and we all know she wrote it while being forced to live in hiding to avoid capture and death, which her family was unable to do successfully. She had the belief that all people are good. There's a woman named, and forgive me, her name is a, a mouthful, Immaculee Ilibagiza, who wrote a book called Left to Tell. And it's about how she survived the Rwandan genocide in 1994 by hiding in a bathroom with seven other women for three months. She lost her entire family, her parents, her brothers, her extended family, all of them were slaughtered. She was a Christian, and she wrote about her belief that the people who perpetrated these acts and participated in that genocide were children of God, just like her. She forgave them. It's hard to think about an adult who does something horrible as being a child of God, as being a child. It's usually easy to forgive a child, when my youngest daughter, Enid, was about two or three years old, she was obsessed with the Sesame Street character, Zoe. Zoe is Elmo's best friend. She's orange. Um, and so Enid had a good-sized Zoe doll that she slept with and carried everywhere. And it was soft and plush, except it had big, hard, white plastic eyes. So one night I was putting Enid to bed, and I used to wear glasses back then. And somehow I remember I was putting her to bed and bending down. She was in the bottom bunk of a bunk bed. 
And I was leaning down and she was swinging Zoe and those hard plastic eyes smacked me in the face full force, right between the eyes. My glasses broke. I screamed and cried. I mean, it hurt so much. I felt like I had just been punched right in the face. I was crying. And because I was crying and hurting, Enid started crying. I scared her with my reaction. So I immediately had to stop reacting to my pain and tell her it was okay. It was an accident. And I remember telling her, I forgive you, honey. You didn't mean to hurt me. It was easy and effortless to forgive her, even in the midst of my pain that was real, because she was an innocent child. One time, a few years after that, I was out walking my dog. I had a little Jack Russell Terrier named Love, and her name will be ironic in a second here, because when Love was on a leash, on a walk, she would be very protective of me if a loose dog came up, you know, and and she would be aggressive and bark and, and snap. So one day I'm walking her and a big dog comes running up to us and she's trying to fight it. So I scooped her up into my arms. And I don't know who I thought I was protecting exactly. But in the midst of this scuffle with this dog, love bit my arm, broke the skin. I was bleeding. I was so mad at that dog. So I get home and I'm telling my kids the story of what happened. And my middle daughter, who was probably about 10, says to me calmly and rationally, Mom, sometimes I get mad and act crazy, and I hurt you, and I break stuff, and you always forgive me. You have to forgive the dog. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) She was reminding me that our dog's innocence was just like her own, like all children who are all good and innocent. It is challenging to remember that all people at their core are divinely created, innocent, and good. Now, they may lose their innocence through trauma and their own painful life experiences. I'm sure you've heard that saying before, hurt people hurt people. It's true. When you're struggling to forgive someone, it can be very helpful to imagine the hurt child behind the action that hurt you. I want to say that again because I think it's so powerful. It's helpful to imagine the hurt child behind the action that hurt you. Often we're dealing with a hurt child. When we've got some, some person, some experience, we just can't bring ourselves to forgive. Where does that leave us? What is the opposite of living in forgiveness? When we don't forgive or we can't forgive, it means we're holding on and carrying past hurts with us. We're thinking about them. We're feeling anger and pain and resentment, which we know only hurts us. There's another insightful saying that says holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It doesn't work that way. We are poisoned by our anger. Now, as I mentioned before, forgiveness is biblical principle. It's scripture. Jesus is asked, how many times are we to forgive? And he tells them, 70 times 7, which according to all the scripture commentary I read, really just means a limitless number of times. We are to forgive our brothers and sisters forever. Now, what I found interesting is the meaning behind the original language. Aphiomi is the Greek word for forgiveness that appears in the Bible, and it means to give up, let go, or keep no longer. That is the spiritual principle of forgiveness. It is the way God forgives, and we are to forgive in the same way. Ernest Holmes wrote about um, this in The Science of Mind. He said, remembering that the spirit holds no evil toward man and that God is love, we should emulate this divine lesson and forgive all that our hearts may be free from the burden of our own condemnation. God doesn't know anything about sin. 
And of course, by sin, we mean the belief in duality, believing in our separateness from God, believing we are separate from our own divine nature. Spirit forgives this because it doesn't even recognize it. It's given up, let go, never held against us. Now, when we forgive, we stop carrying the incident, whatever it is. We stop thinking about it and let it go. That is really when the magic begins to happen with this spiritual practice. It's not about letting a person off the hook. It's not about liking them or really having any kind of relationship with them necessarily. It's about releasing the situation and seeing what is revealed in its place. When we don't forgive, we're blocking our own consciousness and we're blocking our good. Uh, The divine science minister Emmett Fox wrote a book called The Sermon on the Mount. And in it, he discussed the importance of forgiveness with regard to the demonstration of our good. He said, if your prayers are not being answered, search your consciousness and see if there is not someone whom you have yet to forgive. Find out if there is not some old thing about which you are very resentful. He suggests that if we're holding a grudge, we will see our demonstration of good after we perform an act of forgiveness. By allowing forgiving thoughts about those who have wronged us, we end up bringing about the very blessings of the divine we wish to attract in our lives. What's left when you release the pain and suffering and forgive? It's the truth of spirit, which is good and only good. This good, our good, is revealed when we practice forgiveness. My favorite illustration of this is Wayne Dyer's experience with forgiveness. I think you probably all know who he is. He was a renowned motivational speaker and prolific New York author. He spoke openly about his father who abandoned him and his two older brothers and his mother, <clears throat> excuse me, when he was only one and a half years old. This was in the 1940s. He and his brothers ended up in orphanages and foster homes while his mother tried desperately to work and earn enough money to be able to care for her sons and get them back together, which she did eventually. Wayne details the anger and rage he felt toward his father. For years, he said almost every night he would dream about fighting him and confronting him. And as he grew older, he became obsessed with finding this man who caused his family so much pain and suffering. Then one day in his 30s, Wayne learned from a cousin that he didn't even know he had that his father had died 10 years earlier. Even after learning this, he was filled with rage for him. He wanted to go to his grave. He had very limited information. All he knew was the city he was buried in, Biloxi, Mississippi, and he knew the year that he started. It's just an amazing story of spirit at work. Wayne ended up renting a car, and he had planned to drive to Biloxi, and in the rental car that had never been rented to anyone else before, it had less than a mile on the odometer, he had to get in, and he was looking for the seatbelt, and he had to get underneath the, the floorboard under the car, underneath the seats, and underneath there, he found a business card that said Candlelight Inn, Biloxi, Mississippi, and he thought that was so odd, he couldn't even figure out how could that have gotten in this car, so he sets it aside, he gets to Biloxi, he doesn't know what cemetery he's buried in, so he has to get on the phone and start making calls and doing some research, and he ends up discovering that his father is buried on the grounds of the Candlelight Inn in Biloxi, Mississippi. It's an amazing story. So something bigger was at play here, clearly. He finally gets to the grave, and he admitted he considered peeing on it, but he didn't. Instead, in that moment, he let out his rage. He cried, he yelled, he talked to his father for several hours at that gravesite. And then suddenly he felt a wave of calmness and peace wash over him. He finally knew the time had come to abandon the hurt and anger that he had carried for all those years. 
he said out loud to his father's grave, I forgive you. From that moment on, he sent the man who abandoned him all those years earlier only love. Forgiving his father was the most important spiritual practice Wayne Dyer could have done. It propelled him into his purpose, and as Emmett Fox told us, his act of forgiveness helped demonstrate his good. Wayne's life was completely changed. He released the situation, and almost immediately, his good was revealed in its place. He went back home after that time at the grave, and he had two weeks before his university professor job started back up. And in those two weeks, he had taken all his notes from years of his work in a psychology practice, and he wrote his first book, the Your Erroneous Zones. The book became a bestseller. It sold millions of copies. It started his life on a trajectory of enormous success and well-being. His health improved. He dropped bad habits he had had. He found love, got married, had children. His life experience was good after he released and let go of years of resentment and anger. His story is so powerful. Forgiveness is an opportunity to turn away from pain, releasing it and letting it go, and ultimately turn toward God. If you think of it this way, when we are holding tightly to grudges and past hurts and regret, our hands are closed, our fists are tight, and we don't have that open hand that is ready to receive our good. By not practicing forgiveness, as I said, we're blocking our good. So the call to action today is for each of us to consider what needs forgiving in our lives. No one can answer that but you. Only you know who or what you might need to forgive. But I really encourage you to think about it and use this spiritual practice because you deserve all the good that is available to you. Because as Dr. Bob would say, you're wonderful, and so am I, and so it is. Thank you. All right, we're going to have Vance come up. Thank you, CSL Midtown. Thank you, Reverend Cynthia. What an awesome talk. Two talks, actually. With Maya and this, this talk with all that information in it gives us an idea of what we can do to forgive. Um, and in that, we've got the gratitude. We have a wonderful group here this morning. And um, I'm going to go through our affirmation of prosperity. You can donate online at cslmidtown.org slash donate. Um, click the QR code, if you will, with me, say our affirmation of prosperity. I live in a universe of abundance. As I freely and joyfully give, I join in the divine flow. And all that I share with life returns to me, multiplied abundantly. And so it is. And then next week is the beginning. It's the first Sunday in March, in May, May. <laughs> that we've got, um, and we're going to have our annual meeting that, that Sunday. So if you're in town, please come and join us. If you're not, we're going to do it on Zoom as well. So everybody anywhere can join us for that. And we'd love to have you here. We'll talk about our finances, where we're going, what we're going to do. The other thing with that is this is the first month that we're only going to meet the first week of the month. So from May forward, we're going to meet the first week of the month and have a potluck. So if you want, come join us. We're going to do that. The other weeks will be online on Zoom so everybody can join us that way as well. So we're continuing on in our service that way. Um, Reverend Dr. Bob will be back with us next week. Enjoy that, his time off today. So if you will, now with me, let's do our affirmation of life. I leave this place now knowing something better than I knew before. I go forth into the world with a, and a mind of good, good sense. I look at the world in a greater way, knowing that I have within me everything I need to create the life I desire. I give thanks for this understanding 
and I am grateful for the spirit of life that lives through me. And so it is. Have a great week, everybody.